Good morning and welcome to the Lakers Lowdown. I'm Anthony Irwin. Today on the show, well, winning time has had its penultimate uh, episode, so I have some thoughts on the season to this point. Uh, Team USA failed to medal, so I'll have some thoughts on that. And uh, some questions also from the iTunes mailbag, uh, a couple of them, actually. So plenty of stuff. Let's get to it. I want to start with the Team USA thing because that's the actual like basketball prescient or you know pressing matters uh, having to do with the basketball and and the sport as we kind of know it in this country and some of the issues that have now led to two straight disappointing trips to uh, the FIBA World Cup and you know I I think. I think we're too quick to just say it's one thing that has led to the the, the Lakers. Team USA uh, losing in that tournament for now two straight times in, in kind of embarrassing fashion, especially compared to like where we stand actually in the world of basketball. Um, I saw some people blaming AAU. That's kind of predictable. Um, it has its problems, but if you uh, listen to the episode that I did with Jason Maples a few weeks back, maybe about a month or, month or so ago, uh, I think I thought that conversation um, really kind of I, I thought covered the AAU base pretty well. But uh, you know, I, I think it has its issues, and and there are some shortcomings to the way that the game is being taught. Um, that, that I think we're still dealing with, obviously you can't have the con- a conversation about falling short in FIBA world cup play and not look at the rosters that are going there. Right. This is a C team, right? Maybe, you know, uh, and I would imagine that an A team will go to Paris, uh, a, because it's Paris in 2024. Um, and B, because they we just lost again, right? Um, usually we, we tend to respond pretty well to losing, which it didn't take getting to that point. Uh, but, but, you know, that's just kind of how it works with the sport in this country. I think, obviously, you have to credit the rest of the world for the steps forward that it has taken as it pertains to basketball. Uh, the sport is in a very good place around the world and continues to produce MVP caliber players. Thing is, those MVP caliber players, like the the, the MVP and the runners up this year, uh, Embiid, Jokic, Giannis, those guys didn't play in this tournament. Luka did, um, and and his team didn't. Uh, also, fell short of expectations, I would say. But yeah, it's it, you know those 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 players who you would think would dominate. Um, our team in this setting, those guys didn't play. So we don't even really have that to point to either, right? You could say Serbia had its B team there because Jokic wasn't playing. You could say Greece had its Z team (laughs) because Giannis wasn't playing. They had like all the wrong attendacompos playing in in that tournament. Uh, So like you could, you know, that's, that's the other thing though, like crediting the rest of the world for the steps that steps forward that it has taken. The other thing, too, and and this is where um, my frustrations with Adam Silver kind of creep up to the forefront again. Under his watch, stars have stopped considering their impact on the sport and and on everybody's approach to the sport, where you have so many stars. And it's not just an American thing, right? I just talked a second ago about uh, MVP caliber players not playing in FIBA from around the world. Um, But... But you look at like, you look at the NBA's uh, continued battles with load management and what that has done to the sport and what it has done to the regular season in particular and and how the postseason is almost a completely different sport from what we see 82 games uh, from October through to whatever it is, April. And... And, you know, I, I really think that kind of carries forward into the way that we approach global basketball, these global tournaments where, you know, 
obviously you could point to David Stern being the first commissioner to say, nope, we're going to send NBA players to the Olympics. And thus was born the dream team. And that planted the seeds of the, the sports growth around the world. And again, the world deserves credit for growing uh, their basketball programs the way that they have, but, or the way that it has, but you know, with Adam Silver really reluctant at, at almost every turn to this point to really get on players for not doing everything they can to continue to grow the pie, right? The, the line that always kind of stands out to me and, and, and it's somewhat ironic coming from Shaq, but you know, Shaq, when he was super frustrated with Ben Simmons was sitting there telling him that like, you don't mess with the money. And, and, you know, Ben Simmons sitting out while presumably healthy at the time, though we have a little bit more information now that might indicate that he wasn't maybe healthy or hasn't been healthy in, in quite some time. But, but Shaq basically told him and other NBA players, like, don't mess with the money. You have to keep playing. You can't develop this, rela- this uh, reputation for, you know, as a soft league, a league that doesn't care about its fan, its customer. And, and yet it has developed that reputation. That is a, a reality of, of the way that the NBA is perceived. And I think you, you, you look at that and the league wide habits that are formed through those practices. And you look at our response to, um, to global play, these global tournaments and, and yeah, of course it would carry over, right? The redeem team you know, existed in 08 uh, the way that it did because 04 was such a disaster, right? That team, I think, either failed to medal or got a bronze or something like that. And, uh, you know, famously, uh, USA Basketball puts into place this program where players had to try out to make the team, and you had these long camps where these the, these teams would develop some chemistry so that when the 08 uh you know, Olympics rolled around that team took the world by storm and in, in many of the same ways that the 92 team did thing is though, that 08 team did play against Spain in the final. And it was a very competitive game, which again gets back to why this is such a multifaceted conversation because that Spanish team existed the way that it did because Barcelona, right? Barcelona, like that was, that was a, a Pau said specifically about the impact that the 92 team had on the area and, and, and how Spain immediately, you know, basketball started expanding in Spain because they just saw how beautiful that sport can be when it's played at the level that that 92 team did play it at. And, and, you know, you, 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 uh, you look at 08 and that team wins its gold medal. Uh, then you bring back much of the same roster in 2012 and that team, you know, arguably either 08 or 2012, either of those teams you could say is the greatest collection of talent that the, the game of basketball has ever seen. Um, and then ever since 2012, you've seen interest in doing that in, in, in participating in that stuff dissipate. Now I think Paul George's injury, um, played a role, it play, has played a role in that as well. Right. Um, that was in a in a uh, exhibition game that I think spooked a lot of NBA players and certainly a lot of NBA teams um, at, at watching him go down that way. So I think that's a factor. But I think the biggest factor is like we realized, oh, yeah, when we really want to, we'll just go out and smoke everybody. We'll flip the switch. We'll send our absolute best team. And that team will go out there and, and beat the crap out of basically everybody else out there. You might play a couple competitive games here and there. But for the most part, like in tournaments that we really, really, really care about, and the only one is really the Olympics, um, we'll continue to send our best, and and it'll just kind of slowly and has slowly gotten back to what it was like heading into 2004, where at that time you were just kind of like, you know, they would send out (laughs) an email, and everybody would kind of like, you know, you'd have certain players respond, and then they'd say like, all right, we'll have a practice, We'll, we'll introduce you to our coach at that time. I think it was like Larry Brown and like Greg Popovich was on that staff. And, you know, you, you, you hope to develop enough chemistry to, to not embarrass yourself. And then that team did. 
and and you have this kind of cycle kind of thing and i think we you know now now with two straight fiba tournaments i would hope that adam silver kind of at at the very least i don't think he's going to legislate any like competition in fiba from nba players I, there's i don't honestly think there's anything he can do but i would hope that the next time he's in front of the players union he at least kind of digs at them you know that david stern would kind of say like man that's two in a row you guys suck <laughs> And, and I would, I would hope that we would get something like that from, from Adam Silver to basically kind of say like, we can start caring about this thing. Or are we ever going to win that? Are we just, we just decided that we don't care about this, that on one of the, 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 and, and by the way, this is something the NBA should be kind of invested in because we have seen what these kinds of tournaments do for the brand of a sport around the world, right? The world cup. Imagine, imagine like, imagine consider the 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 you know we'll say uh uk right or or any of these european teams or european countries imagine if they just decided like nah we don't care about the world cup anymore like we'll, we'll send who's available and give them a couple practices and we'll just kind of move on imagine it, it <laughs> it's it's not something you can fathom because that is not the way that and by the way the the way that like the rest of the world looks at the world cup is how a lot of these countries look at fiba you look at the way that you know germany responded when they when they beat us and when they won the tournament eventually right uh you look at the way that like these these teams will just go out there and it means the world to compete on this stage and you know for us we've developed this like too cool for school apathy that I think has really kind of taken hold in the all-star game, for example, right? And and all of these things, like all of these opportunities to grow the sport are being kind of squandered because today's generation of, of basketball players just kind of like, eh, you know, we're paid, paid. So good luck to the younger guys who have to compete in that thing next. It's a bummer. It's a bummer. And, and, and losing the way that we did... Um, and by the way, this isn't just a, 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 a player thing too. Like, I think the coaches, I think have a lot to answer for here. Steve Kerr has a lot to answer for. He coached with incredible ar arrogance where it was clear from the very get go that the, the starting lineup as it existed for a while there, um, was eventually going to bite them in the ass and that like leaning on Jalen Brunson, um, and, and refusing to adjust from leaning on Jalen Brunson the way that they did was eventually going to bite them in the ass. And it did, right? It, it eventually did. Uh, the fact that Jaron Jackson Jr., um, you know, and, and all of these single big lineups against bigger European teams, uh, like, eventually that was going to bite them in the ass. And, and a, like, Steve Kerr talked a lot about, like, it's not 1992 anymore. Well, we could say the same thing to you, Steve. <laughs> You know, it's not 1992 anymore. Your coaching is going to matter here. And, and all of the clear politics that went on with this team eventually took their toll as well. So I think just collective arrogance is, is, is a big factor here. Not the, right? I don't think there is a central factor. I think there are, there are several big factors in what leads to Team USA now dropping two straight FIBA tournaments in the way that it has. Um, and... And I don't know. I hope that they start caring about it. I, I think it is an opportunity to continue to grow the sport. And, uh, you know, every opportunity that, that, you know, you can grow something that goes squandered is just that. It is a squandered opportunity. Uh, so we'll see what the response is. I would imagine it's going to be pretty positive as the, as the, the Olympics take place next year. And it is in Paris and it will be, you know, this this big deal uh, that I think NBA players will actually come out for. But I hope that like FIBA is something that we start taking a little bit more seriously. Uh, all right, it's a totally awkward segue. The next one here is I want to talk about winning time. And uh, the again, the second to last episode took place Sunday night. So spoiler alert for those of you who has, haven't watched it quite yet though i would say google would be the ultimate spoiler here 
as all of these things actually happened. Um, maybe not in the way that uh, we have seen in the show, but but here we are. Um, I have talked all season long with the show about uh, choices that HBO have made that have really kind of intrigued me, have, have left me kind of scratching my head. Um, in the first season, HBO actually followed the book, Jeff Perlman's book, um, Showtime, very closely. Like it was actually, you know, no, no, there were some dramatic characterizations and there were some dramatic choices here. There were some scores that were, you know, obviously not uh, consistent with how the, the, the scores went in, in, um, in those years or whatever. But like overall, I thought in terms of the tone of the show matching the tone of the book, season one was way closer. And we saw the response from those central figures to that show, right? Jerry West was getting ready to sue. Uh, Magic Johnson, everybody, all of those Showtime Lakers were, were essentially like lining up to shit on the show. And, um, you know, in, in fairness to her, Jeannie was one of the people who said, like, even then, that she liked the show, that was ent entertained by the show. Uh, so her continued support of the show is, it, it, I don't think it is, um, I think there is some of, like, the way that she's characterized, and, like, there are certain people that aren't going to have a problem with the way that they're char characterized, especially in this season, uh, who I, I, I think have gone kind of quiet or continue to actually support the show. But like, I said this to Aaron, HBO is the channel of sex, drugs, and alcohol, right? Like that's, that's like their thing that it, uh, almost to a fault, they, they will rely on, on that aspect of humanity and, and show its impact on the things around the, the, the characters. Right. And, and in this show, they have taken the Showtime Lakers, a, a team where one of the members of the team recalls walking into the office uh, in, in, in like as after I think they were either drafted or, you know, acquired, however they were, they go to the front desk and, and um, ask to, to, you know, they're getting ready to, to ask where to go or whatever. And there's Mike Tyson having sex with some woman on the, <laughs> on the lobby desk there. Um, and they had to find their own way to wherever they had to go. That is like a thing. Like Magic Johnson used to, you know, he had this giant mansion in, in L.A. And uh, through these extravagant parties that were filled with women who he would obviously do adult things with. <laughs> it's how I'll put it. And a lot of his teammates participated it in it. And and like at one point in last night's episode, you have the whole team sitting there in the forum club looking at Norm Nixon, who was about to be traded. Um and, and Norm Nixon was the only partier there, and none of the other Showtime Lakers were partying at this <laughs> at the scene. Um in, including Magic Johnson, who again was like one of LA's like iconic playboys at that time. Yeah, he was interested in cooking and they had this budding relationship and he was trying to figure that out as well. And, and yes, eventually they do get um, engaged as, as shown in the show. But the idea that he was spending every waking moment sitting there looking out his window, thinking of how to, how to, you know, convince Cookie to give him the time of day is just kind of wild. And later in the episode, you have Dr. Bus getting cheated on. <laughs> I'm sorry, man, but like Dr. Bus was best friends with Hugh Hefner. Like this, <laughs> the portrayal here that he was like waiting up all hours of the night, hoping that his wife would come home is just, again, not exactly how that era went. And, and these choices, um, you know, we know how these things go. Like the Lakers are a very par powerful organization. I would imagine they probably talked to HBO and said like, hey, if you're going to keep doing the show, if you're still going to use our insignia and you're still going to keep saying Lakers and all of this stuff, I would imagine the NBA stepped in as well and said, if you're going to keep doing this and you're going to use NBA logos and you're going to use uh, NBA team names and all of that, and you're going to have to do things a certain way. Um, and 
and yeah, the, the season has played out as it has. All that said, it is still very entertaining. Like by the end of the episode, when when you're you have the 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 beat LA and fuck Boston like back and forth, I was ready to run through a wall. Then I remembered how things went in 1984 and was bummed all over again. But but still, yeah, like I I, I it it can be entertaining. It does do certain things very very well. But this season, it has really felt like. You could really feel the NBA or the Lakers' fingerprints on it in ways that I think have made it a worse show. And and for all of the talk in season one about how dishonest that that season of of television was, I honestly think that this season is 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 a lot more dishonest, and it's kind of a bummer that that's the the direction that they've gone. All right, uh, let's answer a couple questions here from the iTunes mailbag again. Uh, quick reminder, if you have a topic that you want covered, you can send it in the, in the form of a five-star review on iTunes, and I will get to it um, eventually. Certainly, as we start getting closer to the season, I will be a, a lot more aware of these things, and, and we'll answer them more quickly. But uh, here it is on August 20th, a couple weeks ago, I guess. Uh, do de Catron, do, I don't know, um, writes... Love the pod. Keep up the great work. Question for you. Have you heard any whispers of the Lakers making a trade before the season starts to fill the backup big slash possible starting center spot? Trudell mentioned on a recent pod that it's unlikely we've, we can fill this role with the remaining minimum spot. Any ideas for trade targets uh, and even who is uh, el- trade eligible on our roster given we re-sign almost everyone this summer? Thanks. Well, thank you for the kind words and I appreciate the question. Obviously, this has since been answered, but as this was asked on on August 20th, I'll answer it in in this way. Uh, The Lakers, now we have to look back on on what was going on August 20th. I believe at that point, the the roster was pretty much filled out. Uh, Obviously, Christian Wood was still available at that time. And uh, to actually answer the question as far as like what the Lakers could have done trade-wise, not much. Like you're saying any of like most of the, the, the trade candidates and the movable money was reallocated this year. And that means that like most of those guys could not have been traded until mid December. Um, obviously we have seen how they filled out their roster and, and, and this spot specifically with Christian Wood. And, and again, as I've said all summer, basically uh, the Lakers have been in contact with Wood for a very, very long time and they and Wood and the rest of the league essentially has been waiting for some kind of movement on the Damian Lillard and James Harden fronts. And as I talked about with uh, Aaron on Friday, I, when when I saw that Christian Wood signed with the Lakers, it indicated to me that, okay, the league has seen that both of those situations are stagnant and will continue to be stagnant. And we are all going to wrap up this offseason's business and, and and start getting ready for this upcoming season. And and as we prepare for that season, we are doing so with the idea that James Harden will be in Philly at the beginning of the year and Damian Lillard will be in Portland at the beginning of the year. That obviously can change quickly as we see how both teams and both stars handle all of that. But when I saw that Christian Wood signed with the Lakers, I, my very first thought, other than like, oh, cool, the Lakers got a center. Um, my very first thought was, okay, looks like Dame is going to be in Portland at the beginning of the year and Harden is going to be in Philly, at least at the beginning of the year. Next question here comes from uh, Magic and Abel. Hey, Anthony, been following you for years and wanted to say thanks. Thank you. Been saving a question until I had a good one. Told my nine-year-old son, Jonathan, uh, today. By the way, today today marks a year since Jonathan Charks passed away. So to his family and to Jonathan, John, we miss you. To his family, uh, nothing but love and support, um, as as I'm sure you're dealing with a very difficult day. But anyway, um, told my nine-year-old son, Jonathan, Today, the playoff rotations are usually just seven to eight guys, and he wants to know which team wins. Team one, Magic, Luka, Kobe, KD, Lake, uh, Lakers, LeBron, AD, Shaq, 
and Bill Russell, or Team 2, Steph, West, Tatum, Cavs, LeBron, Bird, Duncan, Kareem, and Wilt. I have no idea where to start, LOL. Please help. Thanks again. Uh, Nabil and Jonathan from Guam. So, um, my first thought is Team 1 because Team 2 has Jerry West on it, and he is, I think, the worst player listed here. Also, um, Duncan, Kareem, and Wilt, you know, there isn't really a a tandem there that I think fits very well in the front court. And I think, uh, well, you know, whether it's Duncan and Wilt or Duncan and Kareem or Kareem and Wilt, um, those that that front court, I think, can kind of be picked on defensively. Uh, So I would probably go with team one just off the top of my head. Uh, You know, (laughs) that that front court that you could potentially have of Shaq uh, and AD or Shaq and Lakers LeBron with KD, Kobe, and either Magic or Luka, that team is going to be pretty damn good. Uh, so I, I I personally probably go with Team 1. And, and you know what? The more that I kind of look at it, I think Team 1 probably wins a seven-game series in like five or six games. That's That's probably how I see that going. All right. Thank you, everybody, for the questions. Again, send those in the form of a five-star review on iTunes or if you have time please just rate and and review the show as as you might i appreciate those those really do help the show you know get us uh you know getting ready for the the the, the season here and by the time season rolls around it'd be, be uh, great to be able to hit the ground running there also subscribe on youtube uh youtube.com slash at lakers lounge is where you can find the show and you can see me talk two people a whole bunch uh, but we needed to, to to hit certain numbers there as well, again, to be able to, to, to really be in stride by the time the season rolls around. So thank you, everybody, for that. Thank you, everybody, for the continued support, though, as you have to this point. Um, and we will talk to you guys tomorrow. So until then, and until the next time I talk to you guys, I'm Anthony Irwin saying have a great rest of your day. Make somebody else's. We'll talk to you manana.